Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast with Ron and Kristen, where leadership meets entertainment. This podcast features stories with names and certain aspects that have been changed to keep submissions private. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast, where leadership meets entertainment. I'm Kristen, and as always, I am joined by my incredible co-host and CEO of Forward Operations, Ron Ward. Today, we are diving into the world of labor strikes, where leadership, the First Amendment, and workers' rights all collide. And Ron, it's not just about picket signs and chanting. It's about leadership in action. It sure is. But I would like to note that I did not put incredible that you you said that when you were describing me. I usually have to write wrong. So. <laughs> it just naturally came wow. out. Is that what you said? Incredible? <laughs> I think. Yes. Wow. That is. Okay. <laughs> you're welcome. So Ron. before we get into this, Kristen, <laughs> I hear you're speaking at a big conference on December the 5th. Oh, I am. And you may know the host. <laughs> I know we touched on this last week, but Forward Operations is putting on a huge conference. I'm excited to be a speaker there. And we're going to have a blast. Uh, we're going to talk about the conference in future episodes, but to learn more right now, visit forward for the letter, or excuse me, the number four, W-A-R-D operations.com. And remember, it's with the number, folks. The website is also in our show notes, wherever you get your podcast. So, Ron, how are you feeling about today's topic? Kristen, as you know, I told you offline, this may be one of the most exciting topics that I think we've ever tackled. Number one, it it's because I don't think I've ever heard a leadership podcast ever mention unions. Right. Uh, so I got really excited. And the funny part is, folks, is yes, it's Kristen's idea. All good ideas come from Kristen. <laughs> but, but we occasionally have, we get our... Um, lines crossed and I put together an episode. She put together an episode both on <laughs> union strikes and of course yeah. we're using hers. So no, I, I'd say our, uh, we kind of combine the two. Uh, I think I got a but. paragraph, but you know, as a matter of fact, Kristen, uh, if I don't get more airtime, I'm going on strike. You're going to go on strike. All right. You're already plotting <laughs> to unionize. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was inspired by a very recent strike right here in Portland, Oregon, uh, those here on the West Coast are likely familiar with Fred Meyer. It's a grocery store. It was actually founded by Fred G. Meyer, uh, a Jewish man who immigrated here and it was later sold off. And now the conglomerate Kroger has purchased all the Fred Meyers. And so these these strikers were on strike against Kroger. And, you know, it just I get giddy when I see our First Amendment in action. Um, and they were protesting for about a week. And I purposely, did, I went out of my way not to shop at Fred Meyer that week because I read up on it and I actually agreed with the reasons uh, that they were striking. So that's that's really what prompted this. And then there's just so much uh, history with it. You know, Kristen, we mentioned on one episode, episode the uh, how the Second Amendment separates us from other countries, but mm. it's very few countries have a First Amendment to the level that we do. Now, we know that's right. under attack, but... Uh, I am still in awe of the wisdom of the founding fathers from the separation of powers to the amendments to the constitution. It, yes. It's truly unbelievable. And uh, the safeguards that they put in place. And it always concerns me when people start talking about messing with the constitution in any way, because it's right. such a powerful and proven document. Uh, other people have looked to us to develop, you know, similar constitutions. So, but again, I'm so excited about this. Uh, we're going to yeah. break down why strikes happen, uh, what leadership looks like in those high stakes situations. And those are high stakes oh, and yeah. how the first amendment plays a crucial role. And we're going to have some fun as always. And Kristen, I hope our listeners will stick around because I, as a cop worked the coal miners union strike. And I've got mm. some stories from that. Oh, I can imagine. So the history of strikes. So before we dive into the recent strike, I just mentioned with the UFCW Local 555 and Fred Meyer, I want to take a quick trip through history. And this is kind of wild. You're a history guy, Ron, so you probably already knew this. 
But the concept of a labor strike dates all the way back to ancient Egypt, where workers building tombs for the pharaohs literally stopped working until they were paid. I mean, talk about the original walk off. I had no idea. I have to be honest with you. I did not know it went back to the pharaohs. I knew about this uh, railroad strike. I'd done some yeah. I'd watched some specials, documentaries and that kind of thing and read up on it. I did not know that it went it's back wild. to the pharaohs. Yeah. Yeah. So they they weren't the only ones getting headaches from strikes, I guess. <laughs> I mean, let's talk about the the railroad strike of 1877. Yeah, let's do it. Um, it was one of the first major strikes in American history. And let me tell you, it wasn't pretty. As you can imagine, there's a lot of strikes that aren't pretty. No. Uh, it started over wage cuts, but it turned into a nationwide revolt. And what's amazing, Kristen, is that the workers' ability to gather, protest, and organize comes directly, as we've said, from that amendment to the Constitution, the First right. Amendment. Right. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, the First Amendment, it guarantees this freedom of speech. And though I would argue it's under attack right now in the United States, um, assembly and protest, I mean, that's that's really what, what it is. And that is one of the reasons I get giddy when I drive by. I know Kaiser Permanente had a strike here for those not on the West Coast. That's a giant... Um, hospital and medical facility um, in the West Coast. But same thing. I'm, I'm always very, I, I'm very, um, you know, if I agree with it or not, that doesn't matter. I like to see our First Amendment in action. And it's been the, the very backbone of every labor strike since then. And whether it was the sit down strikes of the 1930s or the more recent teacher strikes, Workers have used this right to stand up for what they believe is fair. I think that's important for us to understand. It's what they believe, not what we believe, but what they believe is fair. And again, that's the First Amendment. Now, we can all probably agree that striking is risky and inconvenient for consumers, right? Like I had to drive way out of my way to get groceries uh, so that I you know, would help support what they were striking against. Uh, but the impact can be huge. I mean, like, let's think about the Flint sit-down strike in 1936, and that changed the auto industry forever. And it all ties back to leadership, and that's where we come in here. Yeah, we do. And I will say this, Kristen, I, I di didn't really go into this to be controversial, and union people listening to this will vehemently disagree. We all bring a bias to something. In other words, I knew someone that was against unions. They got a union job. Next thing you know, they're pro-union. Uh, it's amazing <laughs> how that happens. Oh, yeah. But I think any reasonable person would say that in the early 1900s, we desperately needed unions and even the late 1800s. But we have seen situations where unions have literally caused businesses to close. You look right. at auto manufacturers, you know, it, there was a time when I thought we were going to lose General Motors and Ford. And what was happening was the pay was great which, which I guess that's good, but we were getting into that point where we just could not compete with imports. Right. Uh, you still have to sell a Ford or a Chevy or GMC. And if you pay the auto workers so much ab absorbent fees, then boom, you can't compete. So there is a catch 22 there. And there's certainly been some wonderful things that have happened for workers from the union. But I'm just saying because of even the internet competition, capitalism, all the above in today's world, I don't see the, the extreme need that I saw in the 18, 1900s. Right, right. I'd agree with you on that. I want to pivot to this since, you know, the Reagan movie is out. I don't know if you, I mean, it just came out. So I don't know if you've seen it yet, but for anyone listening, it's all about Ronald Reagan. Reagan is played by Dennis Quaid. And I'm actually taking my entire family to see it tomorrow, including my kids, because it's actually a PG-13, so it looks pretty uh, family friendly. But let's take a look at the leadership decisions that were made during the air traffic controller strike of 1981. That's my birth year, by the way. So I, I do remember hearing about this. This happened on your birth year. But President Ronald Reagan, he fired more than 11,000 striking air traffic controllers. And I don't know about you, Ron, but when I was thinking about air traffic controllers going on strike. I mean, there's like a 9-11 video 
all that's 100 dedicated to the air traffic controllers yeah. like their pov and it's wild without them can you, i mean can you even begin to fathom what chaos must have ensued and potential collisions it's kind of like you're driving the car and you tell the passenger i'm going on strike um it, yeah. it's very serious but i will tell or you no this. street lights yeah <laughs> And Chris and I do not want to contradict what we're saying about the First Amendment, but I will tell you in this one, the first question when Reagan was told about the strike is he said, is it legal? Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, because of the uh, the way the government structured, it was an illegal strike. And that's right. we want to make that clear distinction. Yeah. But you want to take a look at leadership, Kristen? <laughs> Show yeah. us what leadership looks like. I mean, there's, like. there's certain jobs that, like, uh, so my husband, swore, when he was sworn in for the police, both departments, NYPD, Portland Police, you cannot strike. Like, that is part of your swearing in. And I believe that's part of the Hippocratic Oath as well mm -hmm. for physicians, right? So there's certain jobs where you, it's illegal, just like this, it's illegal to strike. And it, it makes sense when you, when you truly have an understanding of what air traffic controllers do. So, yeah, I'm glad Ron is making that distinction because it's it's very it's very important. We support the First Amendment. But there are certain jobs that you cannot do that in um, and many first responders included. So they were in the violation. They were violating the law, basically. And so Reagan says, if you don't report to work within 48 hours, you've forfeited your jobs and will be terminated. And he said that at a press conference on August 3rd of 81. So what happened was anyone um it was the patco so the professional air traffic controllers organization and that was a union and basically they were picketing for better pay working conditions um, Thirteen thousand of them walked off the job two days later the majority of them did not return and it became clear reagan wasn't bluffing and on august 5th he fired all eleven thousand three hundred and forty five of them that day and he, he noted it in his diary and he said how do they explain approving of law breaking to say nothing of violation of an oath taken by each air controller that he or she would not strike so again to your point ron they took an oath much yeah. like what police do what physicians do and they were in violation of it so the they got canned if you want to look from a political standpoint you want to talk about a hotbed uh, a potential dumpster fire when Reagan actually followed through because, oh, yeah. you know, history will show many of them believe this was a bluff, you know, as a presidential bluff. And, you know, we're not going to take this. Uh, we're not going to be bluffed. And then the next thing mm -hmm. you know, 11,345, as you said, out of 13,000 were fired. Right. And I thought it was interesting. They got military personnel. They expedited training and they were able to do 80% of the flights, which is quite amazing. So immediately Reagan with other officials began to work on a backup plan, which is a very important leadership principle. But also the principle yeah. was nobody's too good. Uh, mm -hmm. Things will go on without you, no matter what you think. So uh, yeah. you mentioned Reagan's diary. He also said that he took no joy in, in firing those air traffic controllers. But the law was the law. And right. he believed public safety workers had no right to strike. And uh, it was the yeah. same uh, approach Reagan's hero, Calvin Coolidge, took when the Boston police went on strike in 1919. So he did have something to look back on. But yeah. that's a great story of leadership when sometimes you got to stand up to the mob and do what's right. Right. Absolutely. And I think this is... Um completely it's a little a bit of a pivot here but stalin there was a moment where and this is i mean hey it, it could be worse right so stalin there was um their trains you probably know this the train system had been running it had been delayed for months and he was like you better you better fix this he went to the the top of the uh whoever was in the the train division or whatever it was called so he goes to the top he's like you better fix this and he gave him like three days to fix it and they didn't fix it and he publicly hung all of these uh, train executives or whatever their positions were, but the top, he hung them all publicly because they couldn't fix the train delay that had been happening for months. And I'm like, 
<laughs> when you <laughs> started wild. quoting Stalin, I'm like, I didn't remember that. And I'm like, where's this heading? Like, is he going to yeah. give him a bonus to come back to work? Just kidding. Oh, my goodness. No. Um, you know, it's wild. That was told. I had some, a Slavic when I was in the bank, one of our partners, um, he was our mortgage partner. And so he would come in. But he was he's a Slavic man. I believe he was from Russia. And he would tell us stories. We would have like a morning motivational huddle type thing, like let's huddle for the day, set expectations, yada, yada. He just loved to share these stories of communism when the whole point of him sharing that one story was accountability. <laughs> I'm like, wow. I bet that train, I bet it started moving after that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it was while he's also shared another one where he was trying to, he was talking about toxic employees and he's like, you have to cut them out like a cancer. <laughs> so, Kristen, I decided to I cancel mean, my strike on this podcast. <laughs> you seem to be really taking a lot of pleasure in hearing about these poor people getting home. Oh my gosh. No, it's just history is wild. It is and wild. so I feel like, man, not enough people understand, but I just love how he tried to be motivating. And then, Do you think they you know, blew like, a train on, horn? Like we're Northwesterners. They, never mind. <laughs> toot, I don't toot. Know. Moving on, oh. moving on. Okay. Let's talk about, you know, what, what, sparked this whole topic in the first place. So the UFCW local 555 strike against Fred Meyer, Kroger and QFC. There's also Kroger is is a conglomerate. I mean, it's huge. And they are they have purchased they're trying to purchase um, basically like, you know, Safeways under Albertsons, right? Like um, Albert, it's Albertson's corporation, but they own all the Safeway stores. And so that was like a huge, I mean, we're working towards a monopoly here and it's a bit of a problem. So currently Kroger is already in uh, an awkward position because they're, they're looking to acquire yet another, they're looking to acquire Albertson company, which really it's just insane. It would be a, a massive monopoly. So that's on hold right now. But one of the big issues um, after months of bargaining was that, you know, it started way back in July, the union finally had had enough and they voted overwhelmingly to strike after Fred Meyer was accused of multiple unfair labor practices. So that's really what what cued this off. And as you can imagine, it's not just about wages. One of the things I read was that they Kroger is trying to remove the ability for anyone that's not a 40 hour employee. That's what they're considering full time, 40 hours. Some places are 38. But if you're not working 48 hours, you cannot acquire vacation time. Well, what started happening was then managers were told to schedule people for 39 hours, 38 hours, 37 hours. Of course. So it was impossible to accumulate vacation time. So, and that's just one thing that I read, but can you imagine the middle finger uh, being sent that, you know, that messaging being sent that you're no longer going to be able to take time off, paid time off. You can't acquire it, right? So pretty messed up. So I understand if it was even just that one thing alone, like that's, that's not right. So I'm glad that they were standing up to him. I'm kind of on the side of Fred Meyer. I'd say get those people to work. They don't need to be taking <laughs> vacations. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, Not I, baby. It's a, it's a complicated situation <laughs> for sure. And Fred Meyer's president, Todd K. Meyer, has tried to reassure everyone saying the company respects workers' rights to collectively bargain. But here's the kicker. He's also arguing that Kroger Albertson merger would actually protect unionized grocery stores in America. His point is that if the merger is blocked, non-union giants like Walmart, Amazon, and Costco would dominate the market, which might spell doom for union workers. So gloom and doom is yeah. the argument. Fear. I know. It's a tough one because Walmart, that's already a thing where we see all, you know, especially in small towns. You grew up in a small town. Mine's not as small, but, you know, Walmart's just really dominated. So any smaller stores, you know, couldn't survive because Walmart's so huge and they were able to offer much lower prices. So one could argue that that's a monopoly of its own. But here's the union side. They're saying that Fred Meyer's offer, uh, you know, isn't good enough. They've accused the company of unfair labor practices, like I mentioned. They've even taken Fred Meyer to federal court. So Ron, here's the big leadership question. When does leadership in these situations turn into a stubbornness, if you will. At what point do both sides need to step back and reevaluate? 
Kristen, that's a great point. I think this is a great time to kick into the story. When I was a cop, uh, the coal miners union, they went on strike. But here's where everything gets even more murky. My dad, when I was young, had coal trucks because there were multiple coal miner strikes. And um, so when I was younger, my dad risked his life because they called him scab workers. And um, he would cross picket lines to continue to haul coal for his mm -hmm. family. He was working in a non-union uh, company. So that's number one. And when I was a federal probation officer, we had cases where people either got shot crossing a picket line or other, wow. there were other violations of the law that had nothing to do with the strike in and of itself, like blocking traffic, for example. So that's where it gets even more murky. Mm -hmm. But when I was a deputy sheriff, uh, we got the call. Basically, the, the union workers sit in the road. They're blocking anyone from moving. Mm -hmm. And we got the call. It was all hands on deck. Well, we went there. Now, I'm thinking, Kristen, naively, like, we're there. You know you're going to get arrested. Why not stand up right. and walk? You know, we had all these vans. It's going to take them yeah. to jail. But heck no. We had to carry them. And, I mean, it was a wow. nightmare. My back was – and they were cursing us, calling us Oof. all these names. I mean, I, and I I guess I didn't have a real deep understanding of unions, but I went home. I Like, I was so pissed. At the coal miners union, I I was like screw them, uh, this that or other because I was looking. And we're at, not talking about little beta males either. We're talking about <laughs> yeah, these guys. Men there were some tough. There were some tough muscle, guys. You better yeah. believe it. Oh, so that's long a story short, situation. even by the way, when the jailers were processing them, they were cursing them like it. This was a you know I don't know thirty six hour nightmare is what I would call it. But I remember being extremely angry when the circuit court judge dismissed all cases against them. And that's when even the legality of things get murky because mm -hmm. a lot of what they did was illegal. They had a right to strike, not to block traffic, not to right. keep other people from working. But that whole right. ordeal left a bad taste in my mouth, Kristen. Mm -hmm. So I have to take a step yeah. back, look at history, the importance of unions and leadership to not be yeah. tainted by that. Right, right. I know. I, I understand it. I, I, I still remember to this day, one of my best friends growing up, I remember the bus drivers went on strike and her mom thought it would be really funny to go egg the striking bus drivers. Oh. And I wanted, and I'm talking, I was young. I wanted no part in that. It would have broken my little heart because uh, I loved my bus driver. But it's it's wild when you think back. I'm like, gosh, they they stood for something, right? Like there was something bus drivers. I mean, come on. They're very, very yeah. underpaid. But um, that's just that was my first experience with a strike. And I still remember thinking that would be really sad to go egg them yeah. right now. I, but, you know, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, Kristen, from the reason I was so glad you thought of this is think about the hierarchy of this thing, the legality, then you have to go into negotiations, communication from top to bottom. What do the workers want? What do the leaders stand for? Then there's attorneys like unions is a great test of leadership and a great study in leadership. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is such a great uh, topic, but another problem happens that we haven't said yet, and that's when they can't come to an agreement and it goes on and on. You know, the unions have dues, so they pay these people a little bit of money. But right. there's people that have houses and properties. I can remember those coal miners. They didn't have extra money. They're out there striking. And once it goes on and on, they run yeah. out of money and it gets extremely right. difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely there is uh, an upside and a downside for sure. And, you know, if thinking back, it's like we have the history of strikes. I mean, we talked about the pharaohs in the beginning and now uh, focusing on U.S. soil here and the local one here in Portland, Oregon, that sparked my interest into this episode. Um, they're both backed. Well, not necessarily the pharaohs, but the one on anything on U.S. soil is backed by this powerful right. And that's that First Amendment we've been talking about. And that doesn't just allow us to speak freely. It does give workers the right to assemble protest and demand these better conditions. But there's always a tension involved. 
And I witnessed even just the Fred Meyer workers, I witnessed some people honking for them and some people flipping them off, yeah. right? Like, it's like you just, when they're out there, they're being dealt a little of everything. They are. And it's been proven time and time again. There's also been unethical leadership in unions. Uh, a lot of money has been uh, embezzled from unions. So anytime you get a large group of people, you're always going to have people who are monopolizing. They are manipulating. They're stealing. Uh, those things always happen. And we had some of those types of cases as well. But as we said, uh, in most cases, they have a right to strike, but they do not have the right. Think about this. You want to shop at a store, they're blocking the entrance. So you've got people who want to shop who can't, and then you get the owner who's may lose their business. So mm -hmm. this is such a complicated issue when oh, we're yeah. talking about strikes. Yeah, it really is. And you know, this is where things get really interesting. We talked about the role of leadership in the beginning. Yeah. And the history of strikes, recent events, the First Amendment's role. But here's the big question. How can leadership avoid strikes in the first place? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I hope we always try to be solution minded. And this is way bigger than us, Kristen. I get that. But I do think we can at least uh, help some businesses early on. The right, first right. one is, of course, proactive leadership. And mm -hmm. communication is at the heart of it. Uh, I use a ladder. I was just in Texas last week and I used a ladder and I climb up and down that ladder talking about as you get promoted, communication changes, your perspective changes, uh, your viewpoint, all of these things. But I showed how important it is to continue the lines of communication. But the people at the bottom of the ladder has to describe what's going on on the floor. Mm. And someone who's higher up on the ladder has to describe what's going on up in the atmosphere. And if right. they don't communicate, you're destined for problems. So oh, yeah. communication is always the key. You got to maintain good morale and also try to have an open door policy to address employee needs and sometimes wants, but mainly employees needs because most of these strikes, things start to fester. It's not a big shock yeah. when people go on strike. I mean, it might've been in the past, but you can usually see right. this coming. And if both sides will work fervently to try to come to a solution there are many instances where a strike could have been avoided, but right. human nature gets in jealousy, strife, you know, uh, stubbornness, anger, oh, yeah. all of those things kicked in, kick in as well. Yeah, they sure do. And, you know, leaders who listen to your point and act on concerns before they fester and become major issues are the ones who can typically and do prevent strikes. I mean, think about it. If workers know their leadership is truly invested in their well-being, they're less likely to feel like striking is their only option. Yeah, that's right. Employees need to feel like employers are investing in them. There yeah. should be future opportunities. Of course, there's got to be fair wages. The communication, none of that's going to work. I mean, people have to have fair wages. You mentioned vacation. I made a joke, but people need time away. They need that mental health break. And, um, in decent working conditions. If Kristen, it still blows my mind. There were men, it was pretty much all men back then in the coal mine, but there were men worked 40 years and worked in like 42 inches of coal. Like my mind wow. can't even fathom that. Uh, so working conditions are vital to, and mm -hmm. we talk a lot about attrition and we talk a lot about retention, Kristen and I do. And one of the keys to retaining your staff is to have good working conditions. And that also means making sure that people aren't bullying one another, that gossip don't right. get out of hand and all these other things. And people are pulling their fair share of the weight of the work. Yeah. I'm so glad you bring that up because I like to joke around because I am the director of the homeschool program for eighth graders because I do classical conversations. And I joked with the moms and I said, if this was, my corporate job, they would be very excited because I had zero attrition and two addition for this year. So my year over year looks good really job. good. Right? Thank you. So I had zero students want to leave. And believe me, attrition with this type of 
um, you know, this type of role and this type of program is very high, actually, because it's it's a lot. It's a heavy workload. And so that was awesome that we have the same group of kids, but we have two more that wanted to join. And, you know, I, I treat my students. I have seven now. I treat them the same way I treated my employees when I led a team. I recognize each of their birthdays. I don't allow any, and you know, I haven't had to address this because they're wonderful kids, but we, we work as a team. We never cut each other down. We lift each other up, right? Like all of that, we are one machine. We're all cogs working in the same direction. And everyone seems to be genuinely very happy and enjoying each other. And, and you can cultivate that as a leader. You can. I had one student who didn't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance last year, one of the mornings, because we do it every morning, and I immediately pulled him off to the side and said, we stand. He, it wasn't that he was trying to protest. He was tired. Yeah. But I said, that's just not going to work on, on my time, right? Never happened again. So you nip things in the bud that you need to nip. You remain and have that open door policy, and you make people feel welcome and wanted and needed and appreciated, right? And you will help that attrition and help, you know, for people that deal with, with strikes, um, you can, you can avoid those, but you have to really re-examine yourself as how is, how are you as a leader and how is your leadership team? Yeah. And I do think there were strikes in the past that could not have been avoided, but, sure. um, I, I do, you know, with, with today's technology and everything going on, it would be hard for me to think that someone got blindsided with, uh, yeah. you know, disgruntled employees. Here's the other right. thing that puts pressure on businesses is that people know the wage of everyone else. And, um, mm, you yeah. know, you know what the business across the street's paying because of that the glass internet. door approach. Yeah. And, you know, it is amazing because back in those early strikes, we're talking about there wasn't internet and the internet has mm -hmm. changed the playing field for everything, but it also provides opportunities, uh, to get ahead of the, the curve on strikes. So, Anyway, yeah. Kristen, I am so glad you came up with this uh, topic. This is so intriguing to me, and I hope it has been for our listeners. It's off the beaten path of some of the things we usually cover uh, in some ways, but in, in a lot of ways, it's the same. I'm excited about seeing the Reagan movie. Uh, don't yes. do any spoilers, Kristen, because it's going to be, right, I'm going to be in Texas <laughs> next week, so it's going to be another week. Uh, before I can see it, but yeah, I'm the nice thing really with excited. the life story is you pretty much know what's coming, but <laughs> oh, that's a good point. I, I guess I do. You know what? I won't spoil it too much. I'm going to be curious to see if they cover the air traffic controller strike because that uh, isn't talked about as much. You know, I mean, let, we all yeah. know the Berlin Wall and some of the right. big things, you know, the co war and and walking out on uh, in the Russia, you know, the arms talks right. when Reagan walked out on Brest. Bres was it Brest? No, it was um. Gorbachev. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's all I'll cool stories. You know. That's all cool stories. I but I hope that they cover that because, man, yeah. that takes leadership when you go against the green and uh, make a decision time. like that. So, absolutely. And for those listening, do not miss our next episode where we will dig into another leadership topic that we like to pull ones out, just like this episode, that not many people, if, if any at all, have covered. So we'll keep you thinking. And until then, stay sharp, keep leading, and remember, great leadership can solve even the toughest problems. I couldn't have said it better myself, but I'm still going to do my tagline. <laughs> be the leader you're meant to be. We'll see you next week. The Dirty Side of Leadership podcast is brought to you by Forward Operations. If you'd like to book Ron or Kristen for speaking events, training, or executive coaching, visit forwardoperations.com. Be the leader you're meant to be.